Last summer, just about July, I entered a whole new world. And how it happened was I decided, you know, like I'm coming up to 75. Um, I've got a bunch of other things happening. I run a little business here, a little business there. But I wanted some more structure in my life. I didn't want to be like people who retire, not that I could ever retire and they start drinking, you know? I mean, I don't drink, what would I do? So, <laughs> so I wanted to do something, have a little, and it doesn't hurt to have a little more money, you know, senior fixed income and all that kind of stuff. So I say, okay, I'm gonna treat this as project management, what I'm gonna do, and I decided that I need to do some kind of training, and you know, they say build on strengths, and so I decided I would take a course and become a certified teacher of English as a second language. Figured, you know, I mean, surely as being an English speaker, this would be helpful. And, <laughs> and I have taught many times for many years. So this is, this is it. So I, I look around and I sign up at Immigrant Services Society, a wonderful organization, huge and a nonprofit. And uh, they have a whole learning and, uh, and uh, career college big outfit, and I go and sign up, and you do have to demonstrate that you have finished some college, so I, I found the PhD diploma, and so I'm just, I'd never even seen it before, but it was back there somewhere, and I, I photocopied that, they said, that's okay, it's okay, we accept that. And then, although you could forge them readily, let me tell you, friends. Um, <laughs> so, so I go there, and we have our classes, and it, this is like really serious. It was three hours a day, five days a week, plus homework for over two months, and then there's a practicum, right? I mean, they're not kidding around. They meet international standards and all that, you know? Um, so I go in the first class. There's just nine of us in this cohort of people teaching English as a second language. Only one other person had was what you'd call, I don't think you call us native speakers anymore, like an original English speakers. Rest of the people came from all over the world and had lived here a long time, a lot of them, five, 10, 12 years, because it wasn't one of their refugee services. So they were from all over and then we were here. And, and each day of the week, we had a different topic. I mean, they repeated themselves. The first day was teaching methodology and then there was uh, pronunciation, uh, grammar, reading and writing and listening and speaking. I thought, well, you know, should be okay, should be okay. <laughs> and uh, then we had our first class in teaching methodology. This is really great. Teach I mean, I've taught for years, many years. And I couldn't understand a word she was saying. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was so different. It, you know, and you see how I'm looking, I'm not kidding. I would be sitting there like, what the f you know, what is this? And, and the, the central dilemma being it was called student-centered. It had to be student-centered. And they could even quantify it. Like 90% is the students doing things and 10% you. And I thought, what the hell are they going to learn anything? I'm surely here to tell them things. <laughs> it was just such a shock. But, and then, and then, and then there was, okay, there was, okay, reading and writing. I'm all right with that, the reading and writing. But they did want us to write little paragraphs using the target words for that level of student that they could then uh, learn things from them. You know, simple, basic, I don't know, writing four and five sentences with target words on the colonial oppression of their home countries, I don't know, it didn't, it didn't go over too well. And they did, they did ask me to rewrite. They said maybe you're something a little, you know, a little more Canadian or something, I don't know. And then speaking and listening, this was a challenge because <laughs> even though we don't all know each other well, I spend most of my time talking and not listening. And so I was thinking, <laughs> you ever heard that friend Leibowitz thing where she said, for most people, conversation is talking and listening? And she said, for me, it's like talking and waiting. <laughs> and that's the way I am. See, so that one was a struggle, but it was structured up. But then came grammar, grammar. And the teacher, who was marvelous, had been a refugee many years ago from Sarajevo and had come through everything, and she's teaching this grammar class, and she said, and I quote, as you all know, English has 12 tenses, end of quote. <laughs> you know, 
And I didn't want to let on because all those other people back in, you know, in Malaysia and in Russia and in Brazil, they had studied that stuff backwards and forwards. You couldn't always understand what they said. But let me tell you, they knew that. I didn't want to let on. Once for five weeks, no, five days in Augusta, Georgia in fifth grade, we studied that stuff. But that was really it. And all I knew was that tomorrow, like there's the future, I will. And there's the paths I did, and there's I am now, and that was it. And I was so <laughs> stupid. I mean, it's not that often in life that I think anyone gets to feel stupid, but if you're as egotistical as I am, you don't know, you don't let on that you're stupid. <laughs> and I was stupid day after day after day. It was horrible, and I almost quit, you know. I said, no, really, you can't, you, you, know, you can't. And then, Pronunciation, friends, pronunciation. You think, well, okay, I've got an accent, but everybody else did, don't worry about that part. But we had to study how language, is, how speech is produced. It is yucky. There's like <laughs> all the positions of the, of the jaw, and then like all the positions of the tongue, not only front, back, and center, you know that, but then up, up and down, and I just, oh. And then you had to do practices like you would with your students. We had these little mirrors, and you go, puh, puh. Puh, puh, puh. And there, you like a spit would form on there. <laughs> and then, you know, and furthermore, when we did exercises, because you then had to develop a lesson plan and then present this. And I've never in my life uh, suffered from stage fright. <laughs> and I've never felt self conscious, possibly I should have at times, but I haven't. But there, I'm told, oh, it was so terrible. That, is that how people feel? You know, because you knew you were going to fail. You knew you were going to go out there and be a total asshole, you know? And furthermore, you were. And then. <laughs> And the thing was, at the end, because it was a very supportive group, at the end of everyone's presentations, for which you were great at many points, and they would all applaud. Well, in stand-up comedy, you know, there's same thing called a pity laugh, when you're really not going to make pity. I got pity applause. Every single time you'd hear this, like, you know, they had to applaud, but they knew I'd screwed up. But anyway, I did get through all that, but I began also, of course, to know the people and to hear the woman who'd come over from the Middle East with a civil engineering degree and had not been able to work since then, and then the family problems, and then some health problems, and then what do you do? Or the person who, who had uh, come over from, from Eastern Europe come here with a tremendous degree from some Russian university, and here was working sort of as a handyman in an uh, apartment building, and the phone would ring, and he'd have to leave class, you know. And I would watch him be absolutely mortified to sit there saying, I am going to so and so, you know, and incapable of actually being student centered, because if you've been well educated in Russia, you don't think anybody has anything else to say to you. If I, this is just a cultural generalization on my part. And, uh, <laughs> But anyway, you would listen to that and the, and the very, very uneasy fellow from uh, 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 South America who was gay clearly, and I thought, hey, we'll relate to each other. I'm gay, he's gay. And he was very standoffish. It wasn't my personality, friends, I'm sure of that. But <laughs> he was so closeted in his way, but then you would want to be more and more closeted in Brazil these days. So I went through that, and, and again, I learned more about the people more about, of course, how to do things, develop skills, learn more about myself. I've been sort of mentally laundered, you know, to think differently about the world. And now, whenever I'm out there in the world, it's so great it's Vancouver because I sit there on transit and I listen to people from other places, right? Or they, even if they've been here forever, and I'm thinking, okay, how are they saying that R? And oh, they must be from Mexico. They're having trouble with the B and the V. And then I, if they just go, you know, it's all I can do to not, not go over to them and say, your lips go together and you breathe this way, you know? And then it's, it's uh, you know. And so everywhere I go, everywhere I go, there's this world. And I feel I'm a part of it. And I thank you for sharing it with me tonight. Aww.